Hi, we're out here at the Ferrisburg Town Beach in Kingsland Bay State Park and we're about to go on a hike. Um, we're going to go in to look at an old growth forest and I'm so excited you're going to be joining us. I just want to have you look for a moment at this beach behind me. You can see the sand, you can see plenty of room for people to spread out their towels. It's a great place to come in the summer. We're going to visit another beach and I want you to pay attention when we get there to how it looks different. As we hike in, I'm going to talk a little bit about natural communities and also an approach called pieces, pattern, and processes for looking at landscapes. So let's get started. I'm, I'm sure we'll have a great time. So we're out here reading the forested landscape of Kingsland Bay. And to do that, we're going to put on a couple of different lenses. Um, one of them is the lens that's natural communities. We're going to talk about natural communities. Na a natural community is an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. And if you think I didn't have to look that up, you're giving me too much credit. So it's a complicated definition. And to sort of start to untangle that, we're going to think about something else. We're going to think about pieces patterns and processes. And when we start to look at those in a landscape, we can easily recognize what is not a natural community. And what is not a natural community is this field behind me. A couple of years ago it was in corn, clearly it's still being cropped, but uh, these fertile soils of Champlain Valley just seem to invite that. Um, and when it was in corn, the pieces were the corn stalks, the individual corn stalks. The pattern was them laid out in rows, sort of planted in rows, and the process was the farming itself. That's what was controlling this environment. left the field and I'm standing here surrounded by red cedar. There is a natural community called the red cedar woodland, but it's found on cliffs, not in these locations in the Champlain Valley. And so I know that, that there have been cows grazing on this land. Maybe before that, 200 years ago, there were sheep grazing on this landscape. And these trees are here because that process of grazing animals, especially when the pastures become kind of secondary pastures and the farmers aren't out there clipping what the cows don't eat. Um, they turn into forested woodlots, but they're not controlled yet by natural processes, or at least those natural processes have not left their stamp on this landscape. This landscape is still looking like it does because it was an old pasture. When I do this hike out here at Kingsland Bay, I often think of it as a tale of two cedars. There are um, red cedar, which are in this old pasture that we've just walked through, and pretty soon we're going to find the white cedar, which has the flatter needles and the cones that look more like cones on it. The red cedar cones look more like berries. But the white cedar is part of the limestone bluff cedar pine forest that we're heading out to visit. This is the old growth natural community that's out here at Kingsland Bay. So I've, I've chosen this red cedar because it has some of the qualities that help me recognize red cedar and tell it apart from, from white cedar. Um, one of the things I notice are these lobes around the base of the tree. It's like several trees grew up together and got welded together into one tree. It looks like if you cut through it in cross section, it would look like a flower that a child might draw. Um, it has this really peely stringy bark that squirrels use in their nests. Red squirrels especially line their drays with red cedar. And the reason we know this grew up in a pasture was it has all these lower branches, lots and lots of lower branches, long branches sticking out to the side. So it grew up in the sunshine, um, not surrounded by other trees.
I'm excited to come across this plant in this old pasture that's returning to forest. Um, this is prickly ash and it is quite prickly. It is not, however, an ash. Um, it's in the citrus family. It has a genus named Xanthoxylum, which is kind of fun to say. Um, and so I think it survived out here when this was a pasture because the cows didn't want to browse on it with these sharp thorns. I am seeing um, that rabbit are clipping some of these twigs off. I can tell uh, from the way that this twig is cut that this was a cottontail rabbit. I know cottontail because we're in the Champlain Valley. We really don't have an abundance of any snowshoe hair. So anyway, it's a cottontail. Uh, it probably wasn't standing up trying to be two feet tall on his hind legs. I'm pretty sure this cut happened this winter when the snow was deeper and it was hopping along. It came up here and decided to, to munch on this prickly ash. Uh, they say it has a numbing effect um, and that its um, fruits are a little like Szechuan peppercorns. I haven't tried those. Um, read up on it before you do. Um, but one of the neat things about this plant is that the beautiful butterfly called the giant eastern swallowtail is expanding its range up into Vermont and that uh, species needs citrus family plants. It's um, co-evolved with them so it, it lays its eggs on those plants exclusively and so we have food for it here now in Vermont with this native species. We left the old pasture that we've been walking through and now we've really entered into the beginning of the old growth forest that we're here to explore. One of the first things I noticed, which I'm sure you noticed too, are, is the big old trees. We started to have big old trees. This is a bur oak um, and I'll tell you in a minute how I know that. Um, but as I look up through it, I see long lower branches. So it was right on the edge of that pasture when it was growing up. Uh, it's several hundred years old. Um, <clears throat> I can see this cow's wood has started to grow over this wound. It's been doing that for decades. Um, oak in general live almost 600 years when they get really old. Uh, certainly three, four, five hundred years old. Um, so we're into <clears throat> a tree type that has a lot of longevity um, and we'll find out there are others out here that live even longer. Um, but that and the dead wood on the ground. I see a lot of coarse woody debris. I see just increasing complexity in this forest um, because it's grown here for a long time. I'm calling this big tree a bur oak for a couple of reasons. Uh, the leaves are quite variable in oaks, but I did find several on the ground that have this kind of a wasp waist where the lobes cut in almost to the petiole. It has the rounded ends to the lobes so I know it's in the white oak family. I'm calling it a bur oak. People say they do hybridize with other white oaks. So one difference between um, red oaks and white oaks that I've noticed with the acorn caps, red oaks, you often can find acorn caps that can just sort of sit up on the top of your finger like a beret. Where white oak, most of the white oak family, you would tend to pull them down over your finger and they're a little more fringe. They're more like a, a wool cap. So. That's one way to tell these two oak groups apart from the acorns. Another bay in Kingsland Bay State Park. This smaller bay uh, has a lot of attractive qualities to it. It's a wilder beach. Uh, there's more driftwood on it. It creates more habitat for things like mink that might want to come up and hunt and hide in among the wood. 
Um, so it is not, not managed um, and it hasn't been greatly impacted. Um, there aren't too many people building fires and burning the wood down here. Um, I want to talk for a minute though, I know as we walked out on here, probably from a reading the landscape perspective, the first thing you thought was, well, why is the bay here? And that is the same question I asked myself. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, first of all, from a pieces, pattern, and processes approach, uh, the geology of Vermont is very interesting. Every one of these different colors is a uh, rock type. So those are the pieces. The patterns is the striping. And the process is that we're standing on the rumpled bottom of an ancient ocean. So as continents collided, the Iapetus Ocean closed, these rock types were shoved up onto the old North American continent, which was was where the Adirondacks, they, they are that suture zone today. Um, but let's think how we can bring that story down into this uh, Ferris Boone area. Um, so here's the geology map of Ferrisburg. And you'll notice that pattern of, of pink touching blue occurs at the town beach where we started out today. So this is not uh, an isolated story. There's base being created at these contact zones between two bedrock types. So this was slightly younger. Um, it's the limestone that we can see across the way. This one's a tiny bit older, it's the sandstones right here. But when those oceans closed, when those continents closed and the ocean closed, continents collided, uh, two rock types came into contact and moved against each other. So there's a plane of weakness that's being eroded by the water, which is creating the bay that we see today. We talk about the limestone bluff cedar pine forest community and the natural processes that shape it we have to talk about wind wind is a wild force in this landscape and we're i'm dealing with it right now uh, the wind's been in my face all day here i am sitting on a tree that was blown down about 15 years ago there was some wind event on this spot that knocked things over but what struck me when i came here was the trees that it knocked over were mostly not cedar. They were not the white cedar that have adapted to this force. Those trees are so deeply rooted in place that they broke at the trunk instead of coming up by the roots. So the tree I'm sitting on is actually a hemlock. Um, and I know that, and I knew that then uh, because it has um, kind of this purple hue to its bark that shows when you break it. Um, some of the other trees that are on the ground here our red pine and other species of trees. But let's go look at some of the white cedar that survived this event. We're standing in a limestone bluff cedar pine forest and we know that these forests are adapted to wind. The cedar graft their roots together, they root so deeply into the rock that this wind event that threw up the hemlock and the red pine from the roots that created wind throw did something very different with the cedar. The cedar's response to that is some of them tipped, and that's great because they were able to survive, but some of them broke at the trunk. And if you break at the trunk and you die, there's no advantage. But what if you break at the trunk and you survive? So I'm standing in front of a white cedar that lost its top uh, in this wind event 15 years ago. And as if I look up in the canopy, I just see this abundance of cones that are that this northern white cedar is using to scatter its seeds all over this landscape. And there's some little cedars coming up right on the spruce log that I'm standing on. So some of the other trees that blew down in this event were red pine. And uh, here's some red pine bark that I'm holding. And one of the things that, that this natural process, the wind does to contribute to diversity in this landscape is as soon as all these trees hit the ground, uh, sumac and raspberry and, and other shrubs and small trees start to come into this gap in this forest. And it just is one of the processes that resets um, small areas uh, and sometimes large areas if it's a hurricane. 
in the New England landscape. We've had quite the hike today, walked along an old field and through an old pasture and out into this beautiful limestone bluff cedar pine forest. Went to a blowdown. It's been an exciting trip. Thank you for coming along. I want to talk for just a minute longer about natural communities. As I said earlier, this is a limestone bluff cedar pine forest. One of the helpful things about having a natural community designation is we get a sense of how abundant or how rare natural communities are. And this is a very rare natural community. It hugs the shoreline of Lake Champlain. It goes from, I've been to this forest, this kind of forest in the Ket Bay, at Rock Point in Burlington, at uh, Red Rocks in South Burlington. Here we are down in Kingsland Bay. But what I want to encourage you to do is for you to go out and read your own forest. Every landscape has a story. And it's so much fun to go out and figure out what that story is. Thank you for joining us for another Vermont Master Naturalist hike here at Kingsland Bay State Park. And thank you to the Abenaki people whose, whose ancestors stewarded this land for over 10,000 years. I think of you when I'm out walking on your land. And for those of you that perhaps have your own patch of forest or a little bit of beach, consider leaving some of it wild. We need all those pockets of wild resilience. I hope to see you out reading your own landscapes. <laughs>